Pastor. Uh, I was actually born in Allahabad, in UP, not too far from here. But I also grew up in New Delhi. We lived in two places. When I was five years old, we lived in Lohi Colony. And, and my father saw a highly transferable service, so he was moved to Motivat too. Uh, so I have very distinct memories from ages of five to ten, the time I spent in New Delhi. So brought back really great memories. So I'm thrilled to be at ILBS. Uh, it's unfortunate that Dr. Sain is not here. He had to go out of town. Anyone knows what this is? So this is the country of Cuba. Have you heard of the country Cuba? We know this from. Cuba is less than 145 kilometers from Florida. So this is the state of Florida in the US. Uh, and there's a small town in the north part of the state. Uh, it's called Gainesville. Uh, Gainesville is where the University of Florida is located. Uh, it's a very pretty town. Uh, very green, beautiful weather, it's a nice place to live. Uh, and that's my affiliation. So as you can see, my title was changed at the last minute because I figured that most of you will not be interested in hearing about mice and monkeys, right? You, you are trying to cure human diseases, so I thought what I'll do is provide a very brief background on gene therapy so that we are all on the same page and then try to tell you a short story where we would like to bring gene therapy to India and you will see we have made some progress and I am very fortunate that I played a small role in that so I would like to narrate that story to you. So the title is Human Gene Therapy with Viral Vectors, uh, Progress Towards the First Gene Therapy Trial for Hemophilia in India. So here is a very simple definition of gene therapy. This is a paper that was published in Scientific American by Inder Verma. I'm sure most of you know who Inder Verma is. His definition is very simple. This paper was published in September of 1990. Uh, it says gene therapy, treatment of disease by introducing healthy genes in the body. Very simple. So how do we do that? How do we deliver genes into the body? Uh, turns out, viruses have been doing this for, for millions of years. They have perfected the technique to deliver their genes into cells. Right? When they get infected, they will deliver their genes into the body. So what you can do is engineer this virus or any virus and to, to carry your gene of interest into the human body. So the first gene, it's not gene therapy, it was the gene transfer that was done almost 30 years ago in 1989. And this was done at the National Institutes of Health near Washington, D.C. Uh, so this paper was actually published in 1990. So Steve Rosenberg, uh, Michael Blaze, and French Anderson at the NIH actually took T cells out of a patient infected with the retroviral bacteria. I just showed you the picture of that and then they reinfused those T cells back in the patient. So this was not really gene therapy, this was gene transfer. So the gene that they used was a neomycin resistance gene. So they simply took the tumor infiltrating, lymphos infiltrating lymphocytes from these patients who have advanced melanoma, infected them ex vivo, and reinfused this back in the patients. And Five patients were enrolled in the trial, and gene-modified cells could be detected in circulation from anywhere between three weeks to two months. So this was the first evidence that you can actually introduce a foreign gene into the patient's body using a viral vector. The actual first human gene therapy trial was initiated on September 14th, almost uh, three years ago now, uh, a little short of that. Uh, on September 14, 1990, 
for a disease caused by severe combined immunodeficiency, uh, or this which is caused by an enzyme that is missing in these patients called the adrenal CD agonist activity. So as a result, these patients have no immunity. They do not make B cells, they do not make T cells, they do not make NK cells. So they frequently succumb to infections. And average life expectancy is between 5 and 10 years of age. I'm going to show you a picture of this little girl here. Her name is Ashanti Dasuva. Ashanti Dasuva uh, actually was born to Sri Lankan parents. You know, she was born in, in the US and she was diagnosed with skin ADA. And here's Dr. Anderson, French Anderson. This is Dr. Blaze. And they had a fellow named Ken Culver. So Ken Culver had the honor to actually inject her own cells back into Ashanti Dasuva's body that had been infected with the retroviral vector, carrying the ADA gene. <coughs> Ashanti was four years old, as you can see, she's lying here in the hospital bed. And then, this is a picture taken a year later. In the meantime, they had also injected cells from a 10 year old girl named Cindy Kissick. She also had the same disease. So this picture was taken in 1991. So here's Dr. Anderson, Blaze, and Cover. Now, of course, Ashanti is five years old. This is one year later. And Cindy is now 11 years old. I was able to find another picture, which is about six years ago in 2013. Uh, this is Dr. Blaze. Ashanti de Silva is now 33 years old. Clearly outlived her life expectancy simply because the current gene was introduced in her body. Sydney Kissick is 39 years old and they are both doing really well. So, Drs. Blaze and Anderson published this paper in Science in 1995 after four years of follow up. So, these two patients I already showed you the pictures Ashanti de Silva and Sydney Kissick, their T cells were taken. They were transduced to the retroviral vector carrying the ADA gene, and then these patients, these two patients were still making, obviously still making their B and T lymphocytes. So this was a real successful trial for human gene therapy. So I'm going to let Ashanti Garcilla speak for herself. Uh, I may need some help how to turn the video on here. Um, let's see. Oops. Can you turn the video off? Yeah. Thank you. So this, is, this is last year. Life as a human guinea pig, and at the risk of being too cute and clever, that is essentially the story of Ashanti da Silva, who is also the rare disease editor at an outlet called The Mighty. Ashanti, thank you so much for being here at the BioBus Center. Thank you for having me. So why don't we start by you sharing your medical history, your story, sure. please. Yeah, um, I was born in 86, um, and it, two years later, after seeing about 40 doctors, I was finally diagnosed with severe combined immunodeficiency. Which is? Um, which is a rare type of immune deficiency. Um, and it used to be referred to as bubble boy disease. So basically no functioning immune system, no T cells, no B cells, no NK cells. Um, and I was falling sick all the time. So it really was amazing, especially in the 80s, to get a diagnosis, a rare one. Um, so I feel very lucky. At that time, the only thing available was enzyme replacement therapy, mm -hmm. which is what I was put on. Um, even that was in a clinical trial phase. I was one of the first people to put on that. And it worked for a while. And after about two years, the effects of um, the enzyme replacement therapy was wearing off. And I really needed something else, otherwise I was slipping away. Um, and the doctor who had diagnosed me, Dr. Sorensen, in Cleveland, Ohio, he had said, you know, there's this trial going on potentially at the NIH, and um, they're considering the skid ADA, so let me just send over her blood. And what is that? Uh, sorry, what is... Um, you were saying, you oh. just mentioned an acronym or an abbreviation. Oh, sorry, yeah. severe combined immunodeficiency. Um, and so let me send over her blood. Um, you know, 
no guarantees, don't get your hopes up, but who knows, maybe in her lifetime. That's what they told my parents. Um, so my mother continued to have hope. My father was like, this is never going to happen. Um, and you know, they were lucky enough in 1990 to get a call from the doctors who were working on it. Um, and they they chose me um, to be the first recipient of gene therapy. First patient okay. in the world. The first patient in the world. Um, yeah, it was really amazing. And I, I'd like to highlight that one of the reasons they chose my family, I think when there's such like a controversial treatment, um, it's really important to take into many things into consideration. One of those things the doctors were considering was do, would the family understand some of the science behind this? Would they be able to ask the right questions? And I was lucky um, that my father was a chemical engineer and my mother was a nurse. Um, so they were involved every step of the way, you know. Um, so here you are, yeah. all those many years later, yes. clearly healthy and thriving. Um, and now you're working, as I mentioned, at the mining. So yes. for people who aren't familiar with that, tell us about this album. Yeah, it, it's been amazing to work at the Mighty. I actually found them online a year before I started working for them in 2016, when I was newly diagnosed with another rare condition. And it was the first site I had ever seen where it's stories about conditions written by patients themselves, or written by family members of who have someone with that condition in their family. Um, and it was really powerful because I think oftentimes when you're newly diagnosed with any condition, you will go to a site like Wikipedia or WebMD. Dr. And it's Google. Dr. Google. And it's very impersonal and it, it feels even more isolating um, when you're just looking at symptoms and what can happen to you. Um, and especially with a rare disease, it's very hard to find those connections um, and find people you can actually relate with. And I found that on the Mighty. So for a year after I was newly diagnosed, I followed them. Um, and it's been wonderful working for them. We're now the largest digital health community. We have over one and a half million members. Wow. Yeah. That's um, great. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. So now, from that back to you, to yeah. see the explosion, the beginning yeah. of the fulfillment of the promise of gene therapy actually coming to reality, coming to fruition, what that's like for you, having been patient zero in that field. It's amazing to see it have come full circle um, from the first trial ever in the world to now it's you know being sold and it's a commercial therapy um, being used and this is what my parents and I had hoped and obviously the, do the doctors and researchers behind this is that it would be used to treat many conditions. Um, to see it go beyond skid ADA, the condition that I have is really amazing and I have a lot of hope for where it's going to go. Um, and I'm excited, you know, anytime that I can to really be an advocate for gene therapy um, because it really has saved my life. That's awesome. You and a lot of people have a lot of hope, and now we're seeing that hope translated into reality. Yes. Shanti Da Silva, thank you so much for being here at the BioBus thank Center. You. If you want to read more from her and her teammates, go to themighty.com. Thank you. Sorry, it was a little long, but at this point, convey the message that obviously she has clearly benefited from the gene therapy trial. She's thriving, she's healthy. Thank you. So, okay, so. Beyond ADS kid, uh, vector viral vectors were also used to treat a more severe form of celiac amino deficiency called the X linked skid. Uh, other back cancer was called Aldous syndrome and chronic granular vectors disease. So they were all very successful trials. I'm not going to show you all the data for this. Back to Dr. Verma's review article in Scientific American. In the last paragraph, he said, in spite of the advent of retroviral vectors that cannot replicate, there is still a chance they could cause cancer. Because remember, the mouse retroviruses, that's what they do, they cause cancer in mice. So Dr. Verma actually has seen the future. Um, in 2003, this was a trial done in France um, by Maria Calzana Calvo and, uh, oops, sorry, and 
amount of pressure. And in this trial, two patients developed T cell leukemia. Even though their excellent skin was cured, they, they developed T cell leukemia. So you know it's nice to cure one disease, but if you give the patient leukemia, that's not so good. The follow-up trial was done also by these people in, in, in Paris, and this time the situation got even worse. Four out of nine patients developed T cell leukemia following gene therapy. And the story got even worse. Um, this trial was done in, in London, exact same vector, exact same disease, and one out of ten patients developed T cell leukemia. So, there was a very clear pattern that the retroviral vectors were not safe. This, this trial was done for CGD. Uh, this was done in, in Germany. And here, two patients developed T cell leukemia. So, back to Dr. Verma's article. So, he said in this last paragraph that in spite of the advent of retroviral vectors that cannot replicate, there is still a chance they could cause cancer. Efforts to develop alternatives to retroviral vectors should be pursued further, which is the obvious thing to do, and this was actually done. So the next vector that was tried was adenovirus. It's a very common virus. Most of us get infected by this adenovirus. This article was taken from Scientific American, written by Theodore Friedman. Adenovirus vectors were used to treat a disease called ornithine transcarbonase deficiency. These patients are unable to to handle high protein diet, but they can manage their disease with a mild version of the disease. So the 18-year-old very brave volunteer, his name is Jesse Gelsinger, he volunteered for this trial. And so as you can read here, he suffered from a very mild form of this rare disease called OTC deficiency, but his condition was under control. He signed up for a gene therapy trial at the University of Pennsylvania to help test the safety of a treatment of babies. Uh, this patient was given fairly high dose adenoviral vectors carrying the OTC gene, and 98 hours following infusion of the adenovirus vectors into the liver, his entire body shut down, his body swelled up like a balloon, the massive inflammation, and 98 hours later, Jessica Singer died at the age of 18. So this was the first recorded death of a patient in a gene therapy trial which set the entire field back for at least 10 years. This paper was published in 2003. And what is very sad is that these, these authors here, especially uh, Jim Wilson and Mark Bradshaw, they had been injected the same dose of adenovirus vector into monkeys, obviously, for as preclinical tests. And three monkeys had died, and they did not report that. And they went ahead because they wanted to be the first to cure human disease. So there's a lot of egos involved in this, this business, unfortunately. And they paid a pretty heavy price for that. So this I just told you already, the problems associated with like retroviral vectors, adenovirus, clearly the patient died in this trial. Uh, uh, Indra Verma then actually developed lentiviral vectors, which is a cousin of retroviral vectors. And these vectors actually turned out to be much safer. And again, I won't go into all the details. Basically, excellent adrenaline leukodystrophy was cured. beta leukodystrophic leukodystrophy was cured. We got Aldous syndrome, sickle cell disease, and beta thalassemia. So this, this looked pretty promising. Unfortunately, in 2010, an 18-year-old patient with beta thalassemia developed pre-leukemia, which is essentially a disease of the elderly. So he's only 18 years old. So we worry about what happens when this patient turns 60 or 70 years old, is he going to turn leukemia? So this long-term safety of lentiviral vectors are also not yet established. So back to Dr. Ignorama's article. Again, back to his last paragraph in the, he said, in spite of having a retroviral vector that cannot replicate, this is still a chance they could cause cancer. So I first develop alternatives to retroviral vectors should be pursued further as well, as should research into site-specific gene therapy. So the reason all these vectors are causing problems is because they integrate randomly 
activate cellular oncogenes in that used to leukemia. So if you can find a vector that will only go into a single site, hopefully will not disturb any of the genes. Does such a vector exist? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. Uh, there is a vector called AAV, which is what I'm going to talk for the rest of my time here. So this is the godfather of AAV, Dr. Ken Burns. He actually first showed in 1990 that AAV has a remarkable ability to integrate into the human chromosome 19 at a single site with a long of chromosome 19, 13.3. So there's no other virus that can do this. Among 3 billion bases, AAV is able to go and find and integrate its own DNA into a single site with a human chromosome, which is quite remarkable. I was also very fortunate nearly 40 years ago I actually spent two years in his lab as a postdoctoral fellow. So I feel really blessed that I, I had a chance to work with the godfather of AAV. And this, this was at the University of Florida. So another, this is father of AAV vectors. This is Nicholas Mzichka. He was the guy who first made the first economic AAV vector. He just recently retired. Um, but he still comes to the university every day. So he basically took new mycin resistance gene, put it into AAV, and showed that you could transfer the new mycin resistance gene to any cell that you wanted. So that, that was in 1984, this paper was published. So here's a very brief summary of a, a AAV vector and its advantages. Uh, first of all, it's a non pathogenic virus, which is the only virus that causes no known disease. So you know it's never going to kill you. It may not cure your disease, but it will not kill you. And site specificity of integration is a huge advantage. So there's no chance that AAV will cause cancer. The virus is very small. It basically carries two genes, the replication genes and the capsid genes. And you can take out the entire viral gene, which is all you need are the two inverted terminal repeats, and you can put any gene of interest that you are interested in, or any promoter of interest, and you can make a recombinant AAV very efficiently. Um, fast forward 40 years, uh, AAV vectors have now cured at least eight human diseases, and I won't have time to go into all, all the details. The first disease that AAV vectors cured was a disease, a form, form of blindness called labor's congenital amaurosis, lipoprotein lipase deficiency, aromatic amino acid decarboxylase deficiency, choroidremia, another form of blindness, another form of blindness, labor's hereditary optic neuropathy. Spinal muscular atrophy, hemophilia A, and hemophilia B. And today I'm going to restrict my talk to hemophilia B and our efforts to bring that to India. Uh, before I get to that, I'll just also point out some recent developments. Uh, uh, as of last night, I checked into clinical trials that go. There are 190 phase 1, 2, and 3 clinical trials have already been done with AV vectors or are currently being done, and eight human diseases have been cured. And so far, there's no adverse event that had ever been reported. Uh, two years ago, FDA approved the first drug, AV as a drug, and this is for, it's called Lexterna. This, this is for the blindness. Uh, you can simply give one injection in the back of the eye, and you can restore vision in these patients. Uh, it's fairly expensive, uh, 425,000 dollars per eye, with twice that much for both eyes. So in rupees, I calculated yesterday, it's about six crores. The second drug was approved just a couple of months ago in May of this year. Uh, it's called Zolzexma. Uh, this is for spinal muscular atrophy. A single injection, IV injection, can cure these otherwise completely paralyzed toddlers. This is a fairly high price drug. 2.1 million dollars, which comes to close to 16 crores. So, this but is where the... There's not so much price. Why? Why, why they're so costly? Because, you know, it's taken 30 plus years to develop these vectors. <coughs> so, <coughs> so, they're trying to recoup their you know, investment. Yeah, just, and, and also, you know, there's another side to that. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'll talk about hemophilia shortly. So. Average hemophilia patient, uh, average cost is $200,000 per year. If that patient lives to be approximately, let's say, 70 years, that will come to about $14 million for the patient's life. 
So actually, one million dollar is actually a fairly good bargain. So that's I think they have done all the, the you know, economic evolutions before that. And actually, there was a study done in the UK. Uh, for hemophilia patients, they figured that uh, actually taxpayers save a lot more money by doing going this route rather than having to pay. Besides okay. the quality of life, you know, these little kids have to be injected twice a week. That's that's no fun, right? right. So the first human trial for hemophilia B was conducted. Uh, it was published in 2006. This trial was done by uh, Mark Kay and Kathy High. Mark Kay is at Stanford University. And Kathy High is a children's hospital of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. So they used a serotype called AB2, which was the only serotype available back then. And uh, they were able to transduce liver. But as you can see, that obviously this work was all done based on a lot of preclinical work in, in animals. So if you inject 10 to the 11 particles of AB2, you can cure a hemophilic mouse for life that mouse will never have any breeding episode. Then they injected the 12 particles of AB2 in a dog, hemophilic dog model, and they cured hemophilia in the dog model. So then that's based on that, they went to human trial, and they predicted that if you inject into the 13, because you know, human liver is bigger than dog liver, and they would be able to cure hemophilia in humans. And they did that, unfortunately, a dose of 10 to the 13 particles of AV vectors failed to exclude therapeutic levels of human factor 9 in two patients. So my point is that humans are not you know, larger dogs or larger mice. So humans are very different from other animals. So the only thing they could do was to simply up the dose. So they went to 10 to the 14 AV particles uh, in, in, in one patient. And they were euphoric because this patient expressed 11% of factor 9, which is clearly therapeutic. But unfortunately, this euphoria did not last very long. Eight weeks later, uh, factor 9 level came crashing down, and uh, all the hepatocytes that were expressing factor 9 were destroyed by the host cytotoxic T cell. Um, they started to attack the hepatocytes that were expressing factor 9 because of the viral capsules are being presented on the cell surface. So this trial basically did not yield expected results. In the meantime, 10 additional serotypes became available. Remember I told you that the first trial was done with AV2. AV2 is actually fairly efficient in delivering the vector to the, to the liver, but it's not very efficient in expressing the gene. On the other hand, the second serotype that was actually discovered by Jim Wilson, uh, remember when the patient, that Jesse Belsinger, when he died, Jim Wilson was barred from doing any clinical trials for 10 years. As, as I suspect, as form of punishment. So he actually started looking at monkeys. He asked the question, the monkeys have AAVs? And he actually discovered a whole bunch of AAV serotypes from monkeys. So he did something good for us, I guess. So this AV8 actually transduces liver extremely well, much, much better than AV2. So based on this, a uh, second trial was done by Amit Nathwani in London and Andy Davidoff in St. Jude's Children's Hospital. They use AV8 vector to, to deliver uh, factor 9 gene into neophilia B patients. And they got fairly consistently uh, 8 to 10 to 12 percent of factor 9 levels. So this seemed like the very first successful trial for hemophilia using AVA vectors. So 2006, when I remember I showed you the paper, the Kathy I. Marquez paper came out where clearly AV2 vectors did not work and AID obviously is working. But in 2006, we asked this question, of the 10 serotypes, is AVA the best? AVA is great for, for the mouse liver, but it is also the best serotype for human liver. That question was not answerable because you cannot use humans as guinea pigs. So we tested this idea. And again, these are the 10 serotypes. And if you are paying attention, you will notice that there are actually only nine here. Right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So one serotype is missing. And I'm sure you can tell which serotype it is. Yes, it's AV3. AV3 was completely ignored by everyone because AV3 does not transduce any cell type. If you inject AV3 into the mouse body, nothing will happen. 
So no transaction of uh, any mouse or cell or human cells of any kind. So that's why uh, there's been very general information on AV3. 2006 was a very good year for me personally. I felt, you know, do you all believe in luck? Because I certainly believe, because I got extremely lucky in 2003, sorry, 2006, um, a postdoctoral fellow from the far Soviet Union, Tudorbila Krishakova, discovered that AV3 is remarkably efficient in transducing human liver cancer cells and primary human hepatocytes, which had completely been uh, missed by everyone else. In 2006, I also was extremely fortunate to meet Professor Alok Srivastava. Up front, I will tell you there's no relationship with him. <laughs> because he shared the same last name. He had invited me to, uh, he's at the uh, Christian Medical College in Bangalore. So it was the first time I met him. And Dr. Srivastava was actually considering, based on Amit Nathan David Off's trial, successful trial with AV8, to actually do his own trial in India. This was in 2006. Uh, and uh, I told him, look, to be, I think we may have a better vector, maybe switch to AV3, and he was not convinced. He actually had already been talking to Amit Nathwani to initiate the trial, and Amit had agreed to help him. I said, just give me some more time. Let me see if I can find more convincing evidence for you that 3 is better. So we actually showed this, uh, I showed him this data. So here we are actually infecting primary human hepatocytes with AV2, which is in pink, AV3, which is in blue, and AV8, which is in white. And you don't have to be Einstein to figure this out, that AV3 is at least 10 times better than AV8. He, Dr. Albert was still not convinced, he said, well, this is all in tissue culture. You need to show it happens in animals. And I, again, I won't show you all the data. <coughs> that, yes, that this is what happens. AV3 is definitely better than AV8, but what really convinced him was the same paper that I showed you earlier uh, by Nathwani and David Off trial. This was in 2011, um, and they actually did a follow up, a three year follow up of these patients, and they published again in New Year's of Medicine in 2014, and their factor 9 level had dropped down to 5%. So I think at this point, Dr. Alok was con convinced that I think AV3 would be a better choice. So I, I very quickly will run through some of the data that we have generated since. This is in non human primates. Uh, this is all published, so I won't belabor the point. Is the, that you deliver AV3 into the peripheral rail of a monkey, almost all the vector goes only to the liver. Gene expression is only limited to the liver. And at, even at a fairly high dose, there is no liver toxicity. ASD or T levels remain the same. So I think this was further corroborating evidence that AV3 is going to be safe and effective. We've also done this in humanized mice. <coughs> Excuse me. This paper was published in 2016. And as you can see here, that AV3 clearly outperforms AV8 by eightfold. And uh, this is the second serotype that has been used in clinical trials in AV5, AV3 is 80 times better than AV5. And I'm still amazed that there are several companies that are still pursuing uh, hemophilia trial. There's a company called Biomarin, they're using AV5. Clearly, AV5 does not transduce human parasites very well. Another company called Unicure is using AV5 as well. A Japanese company called Takeda is using AV8, and as you can see, AV8 is not very efficient. So what I'm hoping is that uh, Dr. Alok, I think I've, he's been convinced that AV3 and AV5 are not the answer. So the first human clinical trial for hemophilia V will be carried out uh, in Bangalore using AV3 as a vector. So this is the vector design that we have come up with. This is, uh, you don't need to worry about all the details. Basically, we are comparing Nathwani's vector versus our vector. So this is AV8 that they have used. And you, you get about 5%, it's, you know, it's, it's OK, it's, it's not great. Our vector is AV3. We have made two changes. 
we need the promoter. This is his, his promoter, not one his promoter. Our promoter is two times better. And the expression cassette, this is codon optimized. Ours is human liver codon optimized. And it has a part of mutation. So this is eight times better. So you can, if you multiply these two, our vector will be at least 10 to 15 times better. And now we have to package this into AV3, which is again 8 to 10 times better. So therefore, we believe that if you just simply multiply these three numbers, my prediction is that our vector will be at least 100 times better than AV8. So as a proof of concept study, we also injected our clinical candidate vector into humanized mice. And you can see these mice, which carry up to 90% of the human hepatocytes uh, in their liver, are expressly close to 1,000 um, nanograms per ml of factor, human factor 9, and close to 100% activity. I think this is going to be a really therapeutic vector in humans. Uh, based on this, Dr. Alok was able to convince the the Department of Biotechnology, Government of India, to fund this trial. This trial has been approved. This is actually an academic trial with, uh, involving, obviously, the Christian Medical College in Bangalore, and the University of Christopher Doring and Trent Spencer uh, working on the expression cassette, and uh, we in the University of Florida are working on the vector. So this is basically a, an open-label phase one two clinical trial for severe hemophilia B in patients in India. And its primary objective is to obviously look you know, for safety. So, uh, because AV3 has never been used in humans before. And I think Dr. Halok is being very conservative. He only expects maybe about 5% factor 9. And I have stuck my neck out at told him that you will get at least 50%, if not 100%. So we'll see, time will tell, but I'm quite optimistic. So in the sum in summary, uh, <clears throat> as of July this year, nearly 3,000 gene therapy trials have been performed worldwide. Uh, Retroval vectors have cured ADSK in more than 30 patients, in some cases of excellent scared, but as you saw, sometimes they also cause T cell leukemia, so, so safety remains a concern. Okay. Lindyval vectors appear to be safer and more promising, but again, because of pre-leukemia in one patient, their long-term safety remains uncertain. The claims of, I, mentioned, I forgot to mention this, well, apparently adenovirus vectors which kill Jesse Gelsinger but have apparently cured a whole bunch of cancers, but only in China. So this, their, that claim is pretty dubious. I don't, don't think others have been able to reproduce this. So the claim of efficacy of adenovirus vectors is China need to be corroborated elsewhere. Uh, to date, as I mentioned, 190 phase 1, 2, 3 clinical trials have been performed with the AV vectors. AV vectors have cured eight, at least eight human diseases. Um, in 2017, FDA approved first AV drug in the US for gene therapy of blindness, a form of disease of, of blindness. And just earlier this year, FDA also approved the second AV as a drug for spinal muscular atrophy. Um, the first AVG therapy trial in India for hemophilia B with AV3 vectors. Everything is in place. Uh, as soon as the vector is made, patients will be infused, hopefully, first part of next year. So gene therapy, the vectors is likely to be, I think most of you people, you know, physicians in this room uh, might get, Guess is that you will be, within your lifetime, you will be using AV to treat your patients. Um, gene therapy has had its ups and downs, but it is likely to cure a number of human diseases in the near future. So the the take-home message is the nano overall gene therapy is here to stay. So I'm going to finish off with showing this slide. It's a former collaborator of mine. Actually, he's still a collaborator. His name is Philippe Labourge. Uh, he's, he's at the University of Paris. He published this article, it's, it's a little note in Nature in 2013, and I'm just going to read this to you. He said, the development of the field of gene therapy shares many similarities with the history of aviation. 
each is based on deceptively simple principles. The induction of a therapeutic gene into cells and the flow of air over an air cap swing. Each field was marked by shortcomings and adverse events arranged on, but in spite of naysayers' lagging vision, both fields continue to uh, get quest, and now there is firm hope for gene therapy. We soon do for medicine what airplanes did for transportation. So I just want to thank all the colleagues at the University of Florida. This is the lobby of our building. As you can see, it's a fairly international group. We have Americans, we have Belarusians, we have Chinese, we have French, we have German, we obviously have Indians, and we have Ukrainians <coughs> in our group. And finally, I want to thank, uh, unfortunately, Professor Sari is not here. I'm here because of him. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Close friend of mine now. He has become a close friend, Dr. Sano. He spent three months with us in, at the university. Actually, he got the ball rolling. He actually, I, he and I met three years ago in Bangalore, and apparently he liked what I had to say, so he called Dr. Sreen and said, We need to get him here. So Dr. Sreen actually got on the phone, he called me, and he said, We want to invite you here. So I said, I would love to come here. I also want to thank Dr. Rajiv Khanna. He actually was extremely helpful in orchestrating my entire visit here. And I also want to thank Professor Vijay Kumar. He actually signed the letter um, <laughs> <laughs> offering me the, the ILBS Startup Fellowship. So I didn't know what was I expected to do, so I actually read. Um, this is just a couple of days ago, actually. I should have done this before. It says, I will be a startup fellowship is a novel effort of its kind initiated by Institute of Labor and Military Sciences, IOBS, and funded by Tata Education Department Trust. Then I was a little worried because it says the fellowship is meant to invite eminent clinicians and basic scientists. So I told Dr. Kumar and Dr. Sarin that you may have to make an exception because this does, does not really, it's not applicable to me. So they said, okay, we will ignore that part. <laughs> so basic point is that, you know, I'm very glad that I have talked to a lot of basic scientists, especially students, graduate students, and a uh, you know, number of clinicians here. I really would like to get involved uh, with ILBS. So I think this is the best place if you're interested in liver diseases. We believe that we are the best AV vector for liver diseases. And the whole idea is to continue the bi-directional flow of ideas to gain experience in, in science. So thank you, Team ILBS.